Today's speaker is Tiago Saxiotis from MIT. He's doing his PhD uh, in theory, working with Alexander Madri, and he works on a lot of cool problems that everyone should care about. Uh, a lot of cool work in, involving minimum cost flows and uh, also things that are relevant to machine learning, like compressed sensing. And today you're going to see him talk, hear him talking about something, some very cool recent work that is of obvious interest to machine learning people, but also uh, has some very interesting theory behind it, related to some modular functions. And yeah, we should let him speak. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, Adrian, for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, so basically, this talk is about uh, decomposable submodular function minimization and via maximum flow. So I will define uh, what decomposable submodular function minimization means, and uh, then we'll see how to how to solve it. So uh, it's, it's joint work with Adam Karsmars, uh, Anish Mukherjee, Piotr Sankowski, and Adrian Vladu. So let's see. So first of all, what is a submodular function? Um, so let's start with an example. So let's say you want to to make a dish, and you have a bunch of ingredients. Um, and you want to pick a set of these ingredients to make your dish uh, taste as good as possible. So um, basically, let's say you have a function that tells you for each combination of ingredients how well they, they are combined together. And then you want to find the best, the best of this combination. Um, for example, let's say you, you pick the, the grapes and um, it's, a, it's a good ingredient. So it has like a value of 10. And then maybe you want to add the, the steak as well. So then you add an extra five. Maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a good combination. So it's like, it's a, maybe you can make a good dish with that. Um, but now, so you, so you get 15 basically. <clears throat> but now let's say that uh, instead you had already picked the, the ham together with the, the grapes. And this had value of 15 because maybe that's still a good combination. But now, the, what is the value of adding the, the steak on top of that? Well, it's not might not be five anymore, right? Uh, it might be less. It, it's maybe one because, I mean, we all already have a meat in the dish, so maybe it's redundant to add a, a second one. So the value of adding the steak, given that we already have some meat, is less than what um, what it would have uh, if we had less ingredients. So this is the main principle of submodular functions, um, meaning that the more we have, the less is the marginal gain from a specific element that we add. Um, so uh, let's get to the, to the kind of how that ties with um, the, the notation in submodular function. So V is called the ground set. Here is the set of, of different ingredients. And um, and the capital F is a function that evaluates uh, each of these sets. So here it evaluates, given some ingredients, what is the value of these ingredients? And the, the main kind of principle behind submodular function is this kind of principle of, uh, of uh, this principle of diminishing returns that I described. Basically, the more you have, the less you gain from adding uh, one specific extra element. And um, in a more, more technical level, if you look at this inequality on the bottom, uh, on the left, we have the value uh, of S plus V minus the value of S. Well, this is the marginal gain of adding V if we already have S. So V is the new element here, is the, the stake. And on the right-hand side, we have basically the same thing, only that together with S, we also had a, a set T, so we had more elements to begin with, and then we added a new one. So the marginal gain is smaller if we is, is, is smaller if we had more elements than if we had less elements. So this is what this inequality says. And it's more like a different way to describe it is that it has to do with redundancy. So um, you know, in this case with, with the meat, basically second meat was redundant. So whenever there is such a redundancy, it's a sign that we might be dealing with a submodular function. Okay, so now let's look at what kind of problems we want to work on with this function. I mean, in general, there are two kinds of problems. One is minimize this function. 
and the other is maximize this function. Uh, for minimization, uh, actually, there are known algorithms to solve it in polynomial time, and maximization is actually NP-hard. So there are approximation algorithms, but it's, um, there is no polynomial time algorithm. Uh, we'll focus on the, the minimization problem that are, arises in a lot of different areas, and it's like it's super, super relevant. So our goal will be to get fast algorithms for the problem on the left. Um, so let's see, first of all, like what kinds of applications um, this is uh, related to. So there are like all bu like bunch of applications. So there's like MAP inference, uh, email segmentation, vocabulary selection, um, hypergraph cuts, and structured sparsity. So let's uh, like say a few details about each one of them. Uh, so, I mean, the most obvious application is hypergraph cuts. Um, it's a very direct relationship. And I mean, also graph cuts, which is a, a, also a simpler problem. So, I mean, specifically, let's say we have this, this uh, directed graph and this uh, node has um, value one. The value is the number of edges that go, that, that exit this set. Uh, so if we look at this, this new set, it has three, right? Because there's three outgoing edges. So, uh, you know, the, the value of the function increased by two. Uh, but if instead we had, like, we started with these two, with these two vertices, and then we added this, this, this new vertex, then our new value would only be two. So it would increase by less. Uh, so, so this is again like one other manifestation of this uh, diminishing returns property, and this is why the uh, graph and hypergraph cuts have this property. Uh, so here's like another example, and um, for vocabulary selection, let's say we have a bunch of sentences, and we want to select some of them, and uh, so that we can generate a small vocabulary of words uh, from them. Um, basically. The idea is what I described before is uh, we have a redundancy here, right? So if we, what we are evaluating is what is the union, like the size of the union of these, uh, the words in these sentences, well, some words appear in multiple sentences, right? There is redundancy. And then Im this immediately signifies that this f of s is a subpontular function. So there are some applications for this problem. And actually more generally, this principle of taking a union of sets uh, I, I mean, there are more, more general ways to state this, and these are like co covering functions and have like a lot of applications. And like maybe another example of this kind of principle of taking the unions and having a submodular function is let's say you have like a bunch of sensors and you want to evaluate how much information you gain from these sensors. So we have these two sensors, we gain, gain some information from them, we add a new one. Uh, we gain some more information, right? But we, if we already had, uh, you know, this extra sensor, then the information gain that we would get, uh, you know, from this new sensor would be smaller than what it was before. It's again about a union of things. So, uh, like another application is on structured sparsity. So what this means is we want to solve, um, usually for machine learning, we want to solve an optimization problem and we want the solution that we get to be sparse in some sense. So this might be for a variety of reasons, like, uh, you know, maybe we don't want the model to overfit. Maybe we just like want a more interpretable model or we want um, just like a smaller, smaller model so that, uh, you know, it's more efficient and so on. So it's like has multiple applications again. Um, so the most standard, you know, problem in this in this area is just like minimize a function based on a, a, a zero constraint, meaning that the number of non-zeros of x is at most k. So this is like the most standard problem. And one of the most standard ways to solve this problem is to compute its convex relaxation and solve that. So, you know, you start from this problem, and then you have a convex relaxation, which is like uh, known as the, the lasso. And we're basically, you know, what, what is done is uh, we're replacing the L0, which is a non-convex norm, by the L1 norm. And uh, yeah, this is like a very standard thing to do. Uh, in fact, you can state this problem more generally. 
right? You could think of having more structured sparsity constraints that depend on your problem. Uh, you know, maybe uh, not all entries of the vector are created equal. Maybe there are, for example, one generalization is the, um, you know, group sparsity, where, uh, you know, you have, uh, you, you, you partition your entries into a bunch of groups, and you basically, you don't differentiate between um, the entries in one group. So, like, you only care whether the group is empty or if it has non-zero entries. Like, you don't care how many of them there are in the group. So, but there are other like multiple uh, other notions of sparsity, like graph sparsity, tree sparsity, and so on. Um, and this is like a, this is an active area of research. So, but like uh, just to, to get back on point, uh, you know, more more generally, you could think of replacing this L zero constraint by some submodular function applied on the support of X. And uh, by the way, L zero is still it is a submodular function because just like it's a linear function on the support of X, basically. It was just the, like the, the size of the support. So yeah, but like more generally, you can capture much more things using this modular function. And like the, the nice connection is that the, there is like a general way to get a convex relaxation of this problem. So there's this kind of problem where uh, note that you know we relax the, the sparsity constraint by a const by by determining the objective with a small f. And uh, this small f is basically the convex relaxation of you know, the capital F, which is a discrete function. And it's called the Lovas extension and we'll, we'll see it in a, in a while, what it means. But the, the nice thing is that you can do, is, do this in general, right? You can just pick your problem, um, you know, find a nice uh, sparsity measure and then uh, state this problem. And now like, you know, in order to solve this problem on top, the usual way to do it is to use a gradient descent variant uh, which, you know, in each step, what it does is it does some soft thresholding of the entries of X. Uh, well, in each step, it, it, some, it's some kind of thresholding of, of the entries of X. And more generally, the second problem, in fact, um, you know, if we use the same gradient descent uh, variant approach, uh, leads to a parametric SFM problem. And we will, I, I will explain in a while what parametric means, but it's basically a slightly more general uh, submodular function minimization problem. And if you can solve that, uh, then basically you can, you know, um, efficiently optimize this problem. <coughs> okay. And so this, like, this was like quick overview of the, of the applications. And this is all, all great. You know, this like has a lot of applications. We said this was like polynomial sol solvable, but like, uh, what's the problem then? Uh, well, the problem is that this takes uh, v cube time to, to minimize. And that's, that's a problem. And there, the, I mean, the reason is that the, the data is huge, right? So there's not, like v cube is often uh, too slow for anything. So the next question is, how do we overcome that? Like, is there any property to assume about our data um, or uh, like basically the, the, about our function such that we can get faster algorithms. And uh, yeah, in fact, one you know, popular thing to, to assume is the fact that F is decomposable. And what this means is that F can be written as a sum of simpler functions. So uh, these functions are, are still submodular as was the original function, but they are considerably sim simpler than the original function in some sense. And uh, you know, the simplest way to to the, the, the most straightforward say uh, straightforward way to say that a function is simple is to say that it only depends on a few elements. So here, you know, basically we will assume that each of these FIs only depends on like very few elements uh, of the of the ground set. So you know, it's a FI depends on some uh, v, uh, ground set VI. It's a subset of V, but has much smaller size. And in fact. Uh, this is, uh, and if you look at the applications, this is not a very strict assumption. Like if you look at most of the applications that I mentioned and others as well, well, most problems in practice are decomposable. It's kind of like a natural property. Uh, let's see more specifically, you know, in, in one application why that's the case. So let's look at the application of image segmentation, which I didn't describe before. And, uh, you, you know, you have this image, you want to segment it um, segment its pixels per class. So we want to, you know, to 
label the, the pixels of the sky as sky, the pixels of the pigeon as pigeon, and the pixels, pixels of the you know, road underneath as, as road. So basically we want to assign labels X1 up to Xn to each of the pixels in this image. And you know, that we, we want each, uh, you know, uh, each cluster of, of uh, values to represent a, a, single, um, a single object in the image. So, you know, one, one way to do this that is used is to kind of, uh, you know, define some kind of penalty function between pairs of pixels or even neighborhoods of pixels. And you know this penalty function takes the labels as input and penalizes you based on what the labels that you you set were. So, um, you know here, for example, like in the, this is one standard choice of such a function, and you would like to minimize the sum over this c of uh, x j x k. And uh, you know if you look at it carefully, like basically what it means is that if you have two different labels, then that that are close to each other then you know you're penalized much more if they have the same color than if they have a different color um, but we don't have to go into detail on what this means the, the main uh, idea is that your function can be written as a sum of things that depend only on neighboring pixels so here if we look at the image you know there are just like these two neighboring things that we look at and this is exactly what the decomposable function is so Okay, let's go back to, to the problem we want to solve now. And, uh, you know, what is the ideal runtime to solve this problem? Remember that if we didn't know anything about decomposability, the runtime is a, a V cube. So now, like, you know, the, the ideal runtime we would expect for this problem would be, you know, linear in V. And then we would pay V cube for each one of the individual VIs, which are, remember, much smaller than V. And this, uh, you know, it's probably something we cannot really avoid, right? Because we know nothing about these small functions, only that they are small. So we probably have to like minimize them at some point. So that's kind of like the best we could hope for. And in fact, just to, to you know, to simplify the, the whole presentation for this talk, we will assume that the VIs are order one of them. So, you know, in fact, this runtime on top uh, becomes order R. So that's what you know, is the hope. Um, are there any questions so far? Yeah, so somehow what's the size of V? Is a P, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, you mean from, from the runtime? Yeah, but it's fine, right? Because you just sum up R times of one. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like basically, if uh, the size of V is larger than R, then, you know, basically it means that there are elements that are not used by any of the FIs. So it's kind of like a, a weird case. So, you know, basically I'm just assuming that V is smaller than R because like otherwise it's a bit, uh, you know, weird. And this makes sense? Okay. <laughs> okay, so now Okay, so now let's look at just a quick, let's do an overview, like a quick overview of previous work on this problem, and the, the decomposable in particular. And there are two kinds of approaches for this problem. Uh, one kind is the, the discrete approaches, which use insights from, uh, you know, discrete problems like max flow to get uh, to, to, to solve the submodular problem. And the other line of work are continuous optimization-based uh, methods, which use things like gradient descent to optimize the continuous objective. So for the discrete ones, like basically the main technique that is used is to generalize the classical Maxflow toolbox, you know, starting from uh, the standard Maxflow algorithm, like, you know, Dinitz algorithm and so on. Um, just like generalize the notions from, of, of like, things like residual graph, augmenting paths, and so on, to submodular functions. So, you know, there are more generalized notions of these things, and then you can basically try to generalize these algorithms to this more general setting. And this had some, had some success uh, starting, you know, then in the 90s uh, by Fujish again and Zhang, and then by Fix et al. Uh, in 2013. Basically, uh, th there, is, um, there are such algorithms. 
but uh, yes, but, but but again, they they kind of re require that you look carefully at these like classical max flow algorithms and try to generalize you know each step and each uh, each notion that is used to this more general setting. And in fact, the fastest runtime coming from this uh, line of work is R cube. So now for the continuous methods. Um, there are, there are a few things. So there's like a method by Stobb and Krauser from 2010 based on gradient descent. Uh, there is another one by Nishihara et al. with using alternating projections. And there are the two that are the, the fastest ones by N and, and Gwen and, and Vec uh, that use accelerated coordinate descent. So these are purely uh, continuous optimization based methods. And the fastest runtime from this is uh, R, R squared. So, you know, we have two, these two different kind of lines of work. And I mean, one question that arises is like, how could you hope to do better? So like, you know, one kind of obvious question to ask here is, okay, we have all of these discrete algorithms for classic, that use classical max flow techniques. But in fact, as we know, in the last few, last few years, there, are, there have been like many improvements to the runtimes of these uh, classical max flow algorithms. So there are more modern, max flow algorithms that run faster. So the question is, can we somehow um, exploit these recent max flow improvements to get faster runtime for decomposable SFM? And I mean, this is kind of troublesome because I mean, I mean it's not really about augmenting paths anymore, right? These algorithms are based on continuous optimization. It's not that you will like, be able to generalize a, an augmenting path or like a shortest path and be able to make some progress. It's like a completely different line of work. So it doesn't, uh, I mean, at least, uh, you know, following the previous approaches of using max flow for this problem doesn't seem feasible. Uh, but in fact, we still, uh, the, like the main um, thing coming out of our work is to answer positively to this question. So basically we can utilize this recent max flow improvements and in fact, we do like a much more general thing, which is to get like black box reduction from some decomposable SFM to max flow. So we can just, like what this means is that we can just plug in any max flow algorithm in our algorithm and it will solve a decomposable SFM. So, you know, there is no longer any need to translate specific tools for max flow. You just know that the one problem is reduced to another, to the other. And, uh, you know, even, even more uh, importantly, our runtime is just, um, you know, the runtime of max flow. So on a graph with V edges, V vertices and R edges, it just takes the amount of time it takes to compute the max flow on this graph. So, you know, there's no extra, like essentially what this means is that there's no extra overhead uh, from coming from our reduction, at least for the case where VIs are, are constant. So, so on the last slide, you said you had some O of R. What was that mm -hmm. O of R? Like this O of R? Uh, some yeah, so, so O of R would be the, the, the goal runtime for this problem. It's the ideal, okay, we have the idea. Okay. Yes, exactly, yeah. And yes, so, so then, uh, you know, we have this the, like the runtime of max flow and using these recent max flow uh, improvements, in fact, we get this kind of runtime. So we get V to the 1.5 plus R. So we, we do get, you know, this linear R dependence that was the ideal one, uh, but we get a slightly, you know, super linear dependence on V. And remember again that, I mean, by the assumption we made that VIs are, are constant, that this V is at most R. So, so this is always strictly better than the previous known algorithms. And I mean, it's still not there at getting to, uh, you know, and not at OR, but, you know, if max flow is solvable in near linear time, it's um, it implied that our algorithm is OR. So that's kind of what it means. Uh, does this make sense? Are there any questions? Yeah, but like, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time if there's anything that does make sense. Yeah, so, so now like, you know, uh, this is our, our result, the, the statement. So now I want to go a bit more uh, deeper into some, some details. So let's first uh, look at 
some tools that are used in this area, right? So like the most basic tool is called the Lovatz extension. So this is what allows you to go from discrete, from a discrete problem, which is the submodular function minimization problem to a continuous problem. So uh, basically this is a convex relaxation of, of SFM. And you know, this F is uh, again uh, called the Lovatz extension. Basically what it is, is just the tightest, um, you know, the tightest convex function that goes through these, uh, these points of the submodular function. And it is known that if you solve this problem, then you can also solve the submodular problem as well. It's kind of, they are like equivalent. In fact, uh, we will look at um, a slightly more general problem. As I kind of discussed before, we look at the parametric problem, which is we have like uh, Lovatz extension plus sum of CI XI with where like basically CIs are almost arbitrary uh, convex functions. I mean, they, they have to be differentiable and uh, some uh, simple assumptions like that, but basically they're just like function acting on the XIs. Uh, although for the next of this talk, I will assume that they're quadra quadratic functions just for simplicity, but we can solve it for more general functions as well. So this is a parametric problem and then you know, what does it, like one obvious question is how does this translate back into the submodular function regime? Well, what it means is that if you are able to solve this, this uh, parametric problem, then you can solve the submodular function minimization plus alpha times cardinality of S. So you have this, you know, linear term that is the cardinality of S and you can solve this for all alpha. So that's kind of like a cool thing that if you solve the continuous problem then you can get solutions for the discrete problem for all alpha. Um, right. So, but instead we will look at, uh, we will like actually like not care too much about the Lovatz extension anymore, but the problem we will look at is the dual of this, uh, of, of this parametric problem, which is to minimize an L2 squared norm uh, based on like W being on a polytope. And let's not care too much about like how this polytope is defined, but it's a polytope that is called the base polytope and is uh, you know, defined by F. So if we solve this, this dual problem, then we can solve the original problem as well. So let's concentrate on this, on this one now. So yeah, so like basically, you know, from now, now on, like basically what we want is to solve this dual problem. And the kind of tool that we will use that like the main way we will try to kind of connect these two graphs is there's this nice lemma uh, from 2013 that says that you can sub approximate any submodular function by graph. Like basically what it means is that for any submodular function fi, you can approximate it by a directed graph cut function f tilde i in the sense that, you know, for all sets s, the, the values of the two are, are uh, you know, uh, vi squared approximate with each other. So, you know, that's like kind of cool result that highlights how um, uh, the graphs and submodular functions are, are, re are related. What is the and, graph code function? Uh, sorry? What is the directed graph code? Oh, it's, a, it's basically the cut function of a directed graph. So you have directed graph and, you, you know, just take a, any cut on this graph and count the number of edges that go out of this cut. There are weights. Yes, if there are weights there, there's, there's a sum of weights. Yes, it, it, it will be slightly clearer in an example. Yeah, can sorry. You, can you minimize over uh, the subsets? You mean non empty subsets, right? Um, no, they might be empty. Yeah, the, the like the empty set is not necessarily, let's see, so uh, for the graph. No, it doesn't have to be non-empty. I mean, basically you minimize, okay, yeah, you, you, you're right that this doesn't actually make sense in, the ter in terms of graphs, but I will actually minimize over sets that contain a particular source vertex. So yeah, so yeah, so indeed it's like non-empty, but furthermore, it's overall sets that contain the source. So it's like, you know, what, what you would expect when you have like an ST cut or something. Yeah, good point. So, okay, so let's like, Maybe, uh, oh, yeah, so I also, you know, replaced here VI squared by order one, uh, which is what I assume. 
So yeah, so how this works is for each pair of, of vertices, you find the, you, you solve the submodular minimization problem. So remember that we are applying this on only on the small functions. So we can solve the submodular problem efficiently. And we found here, you know, min cut that separates the blue from the green, from the blue from the red vertex um, and has value three. So then we add an edge of, of uh, weight three from the blue to the red vertex. That's basically what they do in this, like what, what this lemma does. And you just like continue and do that for all pairs of vertices. So then you, you know, you end up with some, some graph that approximates your function. And I, you know, I will not go into detail on why this works, but uh, you know, this is the way you get your function. And now like, you know, immediately this implies an order one approximation to submodular function minimization. So if we, instead of solving submodular function minimization, solve it for this F, F tilde, then we get like an order one approximation. But like, you know, of course that's not good enough, right? Remember that's not even order one, right? It's VI squared. So really it's not great. It's just like a kind of bad approximation. And we would like to get the exact solution to the submodular problem. Uh, so, however, like, you know, one thing that we should observe and it's kind of nice that relates to the dual problem is that the, the polytopes themselves that are based on these functions order one approximate each other. So it's, you know, if the, the values of the function appro approximate each other, then these polytopes also approximate each other. I mean, this, this is clear if you, if, you, if you look at what the definition of these polytopes are. So, okay. So these polytopes approximate each other. Like, what does it mean for two polytopes to approximate each other? It means that if you look at, you know, the blue polytope and the small red polytope, then, you know, the small red polytope is contained in the blue polytope. And if you uh, blow it up by a constant factor, then it contains the red polytope. So basically, you know, the red polytope, it, the, sorry, the, the blue polytope is sandwiched between, uh, you know, uh, the red and order one times red. So now, I mean, furthermore, if we look at this, which is kind of the same, same dual problem as I described before, then these two dual problems approximate each other. So an order one, like, you know, a, a solution for one of the two problems implies an order one approximation for the other. Well, but this doesn't seem great still, right? Because I mean, all I did was just move this, like this uh, thing about approximating functions, I moved to this dual problem. I mean, still, if I solve this approximate dual problem, I will still get an order one approximation to my problem. So that's not good enough. So, but let's see specifically, let's say the blue point is where I am right now. The, like the main, main um, thing is that I will use an iterative method, but let's, let's see how this works. So I, I will start from here, optimize in the red polytope. So I will end up here. Okay, we have the solution, which is not great. But then what I can do is I can again compute an approximation to my polytope, but the approximation will be around my new point. So this will be a different approximate polytope. So, you know, this is a, a different approximation. It, appro it you know, captures the geometry better around my point of origin. And then I will optimize this red polytope again and again, and then basically I end up at the optimal solution. So this is like you know, one of the things we show is that this process leads you to the global optimum. And in, in fact, actually, the, the lemma that we have says that an epsilon approximate solution can be reached in log one over epsilon iterations of this form. So you need to solve log one over epsilon of these approximate graph problems to get to the actual, you know, um, epsilon approximate solution uh, to the original to the problem. And by the way, like this epsilon doesn't really matter here because after like, you know, if epsilon is small enough then you can just round the solution to be exact. So basically what this means is that after O tilde one iterations, you can just uh, find the optimal. So cool. Now, let, let me just give a few words on why this is the case. Like why this kind of approximate problem gives you enough progress. The reason is that, okay, W here is our initial point. W prime is where we will end up if we solve the approximate problem. And W star is the global optimum. And W hat is the point, you know, between W and W star that uh, is on the boundary of the red polytope. Uh, like the main idea, I mean, first of all, of course, 
w hat cannot be better than w prime because w prime is the best thing inside the red polydope. It's like, you know, we approximate this red polydope exactly. So w hat definitely is worse, but then, you know, w hat cannot be much worse than w star. And the reason like, like that's slightly less, uh, you know, like it's not, not that obvious, but the reason is that because of the function we are minimizing is convex. And, you know, if you think at, uh, uh, think of a convex function and think of moving from w to w star, right? Then the mo most of the decrease in the function happens in the beginning. Uh, like if you think, like, look, if you, as you look at this dashed function from w to w star, uh, you know, most of the, the decrease is the beginning. So this combined with the fact that the polytopes order one approximate each other uh, implies what we want, basically. Are there any questions on this? I actually have a question. So mm -hmm. how, how general is this class of polytopes, uh, this B of F? Can you describe any polytope or, or this is more? Um, let's see. Well, basically the, the way they're given, you know, is for each, for each um, set, you have a constraint of the form, um, like how, I guess I can't write, but like you have a constraint of the form, uh, you know, sum, sum of yi in S is at most f of S. Uh, sorry, yeah, so, yeah. So for, for the, like this, it's the sum over i in S of of y i. So this is like a linear function, is at most um, you know f of s. So basically, I guess the the kind of the coefficients, the the constant coefficients are given by like the values of f, which have to be submodular. But yeah, so I guess like you can't really describe. Uh, any function defined on a discrete domain admits a base polytope. I mean, any subset determines a facet. Now, the point is, the question is how useful that polytope will be. Yeah, cool. So, okay. So now let's continue. Like, basically, I just like have the same approximate dual problem here. I just like copied it. Now, okay, I mean, the question that remains is how do I solve this uh, approximate problem? I mean, this intuitively should be a problem based on graphs. So, you know, it should have something to do with graphs. And indeed, what we show is that this is uh, basically equivalent to the following problem. So you're given a directed graph with some capacities and you want for all choices of some parameter alpha, which is just some, some uh, real number, to find an ST cut S that minimizes the, like, you know, the size of the cut, meaning the total capacity of the outgoing edges plus alpha times the cardinality of the set. So, you know, uh, just th think of alpha being zero here, then this is a mean ST min cut problem. So if alpha is, is different, then it's an ST min cut, min cut problem with some extra penalty on the size of S. So, yeah, so basically this is kind of uh, what this problem uh, turns to. And now, like, I mean, this is purely combinatorial problem. We can, we can you know, so solve it with purely combinatorial tools. So let's look at, um, first, let's look at how these cuts look like, right? So for alpha equals zero, we get this cut, which is the main cut. And then we kind of increase alpha and the S will decrease, will uh, become smaller. So, you know, for alpha one third, this is a set, and this is a set for alpha one half. As alpha increases, the cut moves closer and closer to the source. Yes, yes, because the uh, s, uh, you know, the, the size of s is penalized more and more, so it should contain less and less uh, vertices. And in fact, these cuts are nested. You can, you can, again, this is kind of import, important for the algorithm that these cuts are nested. Like you know, there are no two crossing cuts. Cool. So now. Uh, I mean, we want to find these cuts, but how can we find them, right? So for fixed alpha, we can find it using any max law algorithm. Uh, just like if we have alpha, basically we can create a graph. It's not that, that, that uh, it's, it's kind of uh, straightforward, but you can just add some extra edges to encode this cardinality constraint. 
and uh, you can solve this in max flow time. But uh, remember that we want to, to do it for all alpha, right? So what you can do is you can search over values of alpha using some kind of binary search to you know, basically find all important values of alpha that matter, meaning all the values of alpha that give you some uh, uh, one of these cuts, right? So you can like binary search over them, but um, you know, in the worst case, the number of these cuts might be ON. So this means that you will pay N times max flow, which is not ideal for us. I mean, we would like it to be uh, just, just max flow. Um, but the idea is that, you know, every time you do this kind of, every time you find a cut, because of the nested structure, you can just recurse into the two halves. You can just uh, find the cut, then recurse on the left, left thing, and the end recurse on the right thing. So, uh, you know, importantly, this cut has to be balanced so the recursion uh, works out. And, you know, again, like it's really important that the cuts are nested. So, in fact, uh, you know, the, the approach will be to first find one cut that is balanced. So just like use binary search to find one of these cuts. And then we can recurse on the two halves. But it's like important that because of this nested structure, when recursing, let's say on the left half, we can contract the right half. So this decreases the size of the graph. Let's see this in action, actually. So we have this graph, we find the cut. This is like the fir first one of these cuts for alpha equals zero. And then we just break this into two graphs. So, you know, left part and right part. And then we, in the left part, we found another cut. We again break this into two parts and so on. And now like, you know, in the bottom, we also found the, the, the third cut we were looking for. And this is kind of nice, right? Because in each level, the, the size of the graphs is just linear. So this means that the total runtime of this process is uh, the runtime of Maxwell. So basically, that's that's kind of this this what this algorithm is. There are any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just a purely you know combinatorial thing. And yeah, and and by the way, uh, in our paper, there are also for for anyone that might be interested, there are all, also uh, better results for this problem for planar graphs. But uh, yeah, they're not directly related to the main result. So, okay. So now putting everything together, we started from solving this parametric problem. It's a discrete problem, right? It's minimize a modular function plus um, you know some some uh, parametric term. Here we assume that it's just the cardinality. Then we relaxed it to a, a convex dual. This is minimized norm squared given that W is in the base polytope of F. Then we approximated this dual by, you know, the, uh, by, by doing a graph approximation. So we approximated F by uh, graph, by the cut function of a graph. So this gives us another dual that approximates. And then we solve, solve this dual using the parametric mean cut algorithm. And you know, finally, this parametric mean cut solution, we can uh, feed it back to the dual problem. So in fact, this is the iterative method that we use. Uh, like, you know, this part is uh, done iteratively. So you kind of, in, uh, at each iteration, you inform back the dual problem using the, using the, the solution from the graph. And then of course, in the end, you kind of go back to the original problem as well, which is standard. Just for, from the dual problem, you can go back to the original problem. So that's kind of like the main, um, you know, the, the map of the of the algorithm. And yeah, basically that's that was all I had to say. Just to to conclude, just a few things. Uh, so you know what I described was an efficient algorithm for decomposable submodular function uh, minimization using max flow, and the runtime is you know until the max flow if the vi's are constant if the, the size of the sets in the decomposition basically are constant. And, you know, the, 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 I think this is nice because it kind of like gives the best of both worlds, like, you know, the discrete and continuous world and like, you know, uses techniques from both. And, uh, you know, some open problems is, are the following, right? For, so for this talk, I assume that the VIs are constant, but in general, you have some, some polynomial dependence on the VIs. 
So, you know, for example, there is a VI squared dependence because of um, the fact that our, the graph is VI squared approximate, uh, you know, because of that approximation lemma. So, you know, one question is if there are better approximations, maybe for some special cases, maybe, you know, like uh, in some special cases, there is no need to pay this much. Another thing is we, in order to construct this graph, we looked at all pairs of vertices in VI, in each VI, and, and needed one uh, SFM uh, oracle call per pair. So, you know, we have some of IVI squared calls to this, uh, to, to, this, to this oracle. So, you know, one question is, is there another way to get these all paired minimizers? Maybe, you know, you don't have to actually go through each pair and call the oracle, but you can use the oracle in a slightly uh, less black box sense to, to get it faster. Or like, you know, even, even more, more trivially, do we even need the old pair minimize? Maybe we don't need them, like, right? But like maybe we just need a linear number of, of, uh, of edges and we can still approximate it good enough. Uh, so, yeah, so like finally, one thing I wanted to say is that this is kind of falls under the umbrella of preconditioning uh, for, a, for some problem. Uh, for example, you know, there is linear system preconditioning where you have like, uh, we have a linear system and you kind of approximate your matrix by a much simpler one, like a very crude approximation of this matrix. But like, even though this approximation is crude, you can, uh, because you can invert it fast, it allows you to kind of compute the original problem fast to high, high accuracy. So basically you're bootstrapping a crude approximation to get a high accuracy solution. So it's like a very general principle. Um, only the fact that um, it's kind of not that usual to, to see it in uh, asymmetric problems. So here, remember that both the original function and the approximate function are asymmetric. So, yeah, so this is kind of like an interesting property. And the, asymmetric yeah. meaning what? Sorry? Asymmetric meaning what? what oh, meaning, it? yeah, so for, uh, you know, for the submodular problem, it means that uh, f of s and f of v minus s are not equal. They are not necessarily equal. In terms of graphs, it, you know, symmetric means that it's an undirected graph. Yeah. And yeah, so the like, question is, uh, are there, you know, other such problems where uh, you can do similar things, are there asymmetric problems? And, you know, finally, one open problem is to get like a practical implementation of this, because I think it would be like really useful in practice to actually uh, have, have like, you know, I, th I think it's kind of nice because some practitioner would be able to say, oh, you know, I have this super optimized max flow algorithm. I can just like plug it in and solve my submodular optimization problem. And, uh, you know, I don't need to care about the, the details. Um, yeah, so that, that was all basically. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>